On July 16th of 1988, at the United States Olympic Trials for Track and Field in Indianapolis, Indiana, Florence Griffith Joyner set the women's 100 meter world record with a time of 10.49 seconds in the quarterfinals of the women's 100. This performance at the time was a significant improvement on the previous mark of Evelyn Ashford, who ran a time of 10.76 seconds on August the 22nd of 1984. This physical breakthrough in the sport of athletics was so extraordinary that it almost immediately sparked a controversy that to this day still remains strong in the minds of many track fans from around the world. Building up to this one sprinting achievement, the 100 meter times of Joyner had been improving since her performance of 11 seconds flat back in 1985. However, achieving a time of 10.49 was such a colossal leap forward that it seemed almost impossible that this moment ever took place. To say that this record was shocking would be a significant understatement, but perhaps the most notable part of this one running moment is that to this day, some 34 years later, this world record still stands as the all-time fastest moment in women's sprinting history. However, perhaps even overshadowing the time that was achieved are the looming questions that still remain surrounding this one 100 meters. It's very challenging to unpack all of the controversial subjects surrounding this 100 meter race. There's the wind readings on the day that have grown into their own subject of controversy and technical confusion over the years. There's the point of steroid accusations that will probably never fully be understood as the evidence and overall focus on this point has drastically dissipated over the last three decades. There's the drastic improvement of Florence Griffith Joyner, which may or may not be supported by the previous two subjects, plus a whole host of other areas that seemingly never end. Now, covering every single topic brought up over the last 30 years in correlation to this one 100 would create a massive project close to three or four hours long. So we won't even attempt to cover everything surrounding this moment. However, the reality is that despite this time standing atop almost every single official list around the world in the women's 100 meters, there are many people who choose to reject the conclusion that this performance was indeed legitimate, free of steroids or free of wind or free of both altogether. The arguments for and against conspiracy or error in relation to this world record take many shapes and forms, so in this particular video, we'll be focusing on the primary events in relation to this world record. And these include the athletes in the competition, the wind readings on the day, the overall improvements, and the opinions surrounding this race that many people believe should not be placed at the very top of the world record list. This is Florence Griffith Joyner's 100 meter world record. For as long as the 100 meters has been around, the existence of wind is known to have a significant effect on overall performance. In fact, in a research paper published in 1994 by Nicholas Linthorne showcases this overall effect very well. As you would expect, the more wind blowing directly into the athletes' faces, the slower they typically run, and in the exact same manner of logic, the faster the wind blowing behind the athletes, the faster these runners will typically perform. Now, there is some subjectivity as to how an athlete is affected by the wind, and it's a fact that not every athlete is affected in the same manner. However, in a power study from 1994, we can actually see the relationship between time advantages and total overall wind velocity. It is a very direct correlation in terms of running the 100 meters and how fast you will run based on the wind. But it's also important to mention that this includes the assumption that all the apparatus, the timing devices, and the athletes themselves fit into normal legalities of running the 100 meters. But we'll return to this idea a little bit later in this video. It's undeniable that wind does have an effect on athletes in the 100 meters. And because of this, the governing body of track and field set a precedent at the 1936 Congress of Athletics to make the legal limit 2.0 meters per second. That is to say that any race measuring in excess of 2.0 meters per second wind would not be eligible for world record consideration. Now, this rule is still in practice to this day, and it showcases the importance of accurate wind measurements for sprinting events. So with this in mind, let's take a closer look at exactly what happened on that fateful day back on July 16th of 1988. For this 100 meter world record, the wind was measured at 0.0, .0 meters per second, which at face value doesn't seem too suspicious. However, the truth of this one reading is that this is one of the most controversial subjects, not just in track and field, but in all of sports in general. And when we take a closer look at exactly what was going on in this very race, red flags begin to pop up all over the place. 
From this home video that only surfaced over the past couple of seasons, you can see that just after the race had ended, the cameraman pans away from the athletes finishing this race, and it fixates on the finishing screens at the end of the track. And just above this big screen, we can see two flags, here and here, waving very strongly in the wind. Now, it's important to mention that this does not 100% mean that the wind reading could not have been 0.0. .0. Perhaps the wind above the stadium was slightly higher than it was at track level, perhaps there was strong gusts in multiple directions, or perhaps the wind just died down for the athletes at the exact moment that they were running this race. But either way, the strong wind on these flags blowing in the direction of the athletes running does raise suspicions on the legitimacy of the wind readings and the wind reading instruments on this day. Another troubling issue surrounding these wind readings is what was going on before and after this 100 meter quarterfinal. Again, this race took place on July 16th at exactly 2.35 p.m. And for the previous four races that took place over the previous 30 minutes before this quarterfinal, the wind readings were 3.2 meters per second, 3.9 meters per second, 2.7 and 3.5 meters per second respectively. All of these wind readings exceed the legal limit for world record consideration, as again, the legal limit stands at 2.0 meters per second. These first four races were aided by significant tailwinds. However, for quarterfinals one and two, the wind gauge reads exactly 0.0 meters per second. This deviation from the previous four races again raised suspicion by the track officials on this day, and it certainly raised red flags for many athletes around the world. But perhaps the most suspicious thing of all was what happened in the third quarterfinal, just 10 minutes after this second quarterfinal, which showcased a wind reading of 5.0 meters per second. The before and after on this day in the women's 100 meters is most definitely a point of concern for many officials around the world, and even in the track and field news printout from the 1988 Olympic trials describing this very event, the author made it a point to write out that while this 10.49 is the world record, the Olympic trials run of 10.61 in the finals should be considered the best on record under legal wind conditions, as this race was measured at positive 1.2 meters per second tailwind. There are many different articles around the internet that echo this very sentiment, and their reasons for such doubt also take many forms. But the question that many people have is how could such a thing actually happen for two consecutive races at such a prestigious event? And what are the real odds of something like this actually happening after a strong wind was already measured just before these races? In races officially sanctioned by the IAAF in the 1980s, the variable of wind velocity along the direction of the track was always measured using a wind gauge that must be positioned exactly halfway along the straight. It was also required to be 1.22 meters above the ground and not more than two meters away from the track. In the 100 meter dash in the 1980s, the wind speed was measured for a 10 second period from the start of the race until close to the very end. And it's measured using this instrument here, a wind reading anemometer with three rotating bulbs at the top, which measured the wind speed, and a directional tail flag at the bottom, which was built specifically for measuring the wind direction. Now, this was a fairly new instrument put into practice in the 1980s, but it is important to note that it had also been used for the previous couple of years at various global meetings with little difficulties. The reliability of this one machine was of little concern heading into the 1988 Olympic trials, and another big source of confidence brought forth with this machine was the fact that it was operated by Omega as a partner with Swiss Timing, one of the more reputable companies for athletics timing over the previous century. Now, having Omega at an event almost universally represents a high-profile meeting, and this competition in 1988 was certainly no exception. In this 1988 Olympic trials, there were various world record holders, there were various Olympic medalists, and there were athletes that were ranked number one in the world in 1988. And the man in control of all of these operations was a man by the name of Peter Herzlar. According to various articles, Herzlar was known as a master of timing in all of Olympic sports. Since 1970, he had created practically every timing system for each sport in both the Summer and the Winter Olympic Games. And in an article recently written by the Swimming Hall of Fame, they stated that no one could have achieved what he has done in sports and technology for the Olympic movement. Suffice it to say that Herzlar was quite the experienced and respected official for the 1988 Olympic trials. 
And in regards to what happened on that fateful day about Flojo's world record, here is what he had to say. I was also surprised when I saw 0.0 meters per second on the scoreboard. We had a new system who measured not only the direction, because if you have a tube, if the wind is coming from the side, you have less wind. But of course, the athletes also have the wind at their back. Also, if the wind is strong from the side, it's helping the athletes. And for this reason, we started with a new system. This system gave us not only the average of these 10 seconds, it also gave us the direction in degrees. And of course, I was there, and it was very windy that day. But sometimes the wind came from the front, and then it came in the back in every direction. It was a lot of turbulence. Finally, we saw the wind was coming 93 degrees to the system. It means that it was not from the back and not from the front. It came from the side. Everybody was talking about this wind and this famous time, and I was in the press conference because I had to explain how we had measured this. Of course, we hold first all the officials, the technical delegates, and so on, and also with the press. At the end, I think everybody was happy overall. We explained exactly what we did, and I was feeling that finally, they understood what was going on with the wind speed. He also went on to state something very interesting about Florence Griffith Joyner. He also stated that it was very lucky for Griffith Joyner. She was of course faster than all the others. But here she was really lucky that the wind was measured during 10 seconds. And it's possible that, you see, after the start, they had back wind and they arrived at the 50 meters and the wind was then gone and it came from the back again afterwards. It is not possible to measure all these winds. In his own words, Herzlar admits that if the winds quickly change speeds upon the athletes competing, it is possible that the wind didn't measure what the athletes were actually experiencing. He even goes as far as to say that Flojo was quote-unquote lucky for how she experienced the wind on that day. Again, this is only one person's account in a race that had many more variables, but the fact is that this was even admitted by the wind technician himself. The measuring equipment was not completely capable of accurately measuring the winds on the day. Now, the fact that there were troubling issues with the wind gauge and the possibility of turbulence showcasing more complications. Another troubling issue on the day is the actual positioning of the wind instrument itself. In another paper published by Nicholas Linthorne in June of 1995, he posits that a possible explanation for the 0.0, .0 wind reading on the day is that the wind gauge was misaligned with the direction of the track for quarterfinals 1 and quarterfinals 2. He suggests that the wind gauge was misaligned by approximately 60 degrees for these two opening quarterfinals, and thus it was possible to have registered a 30 degree crosswind as a 90 degree perpendicular crosswind. The possible erroneous output of the wind gauge suggests that it is a very plausible explanation as to why such an erroneous event had transpired, and for the following 100 meter events, the readings were once again accurate once this wind reading equipment had been correctly positioned. The wind is far and away one of the more complicated issues when it comes to this 100 meter race, and there are countless accounts that showcase a slightly different perspective from what you've seen so far in this video. But again, this would create a multiple hour long documentary, and it's honestly impossible to showcase exactly what everyone has experienced. So for now, we'll leave the wind readings alone and jump over to our next chapter. Some of the more tangible evidence surrounding this world record is the actual footage that exists from the quarterfinals races back in 1988. As we stated before, one of the more visible pieces of evidence were the gusting flags positioned above the track. But what about on the track? What evidence exists from this particular angle? In a twist of fate, I happened upon some pretty rare footage from the actual track recorded with a portable camera by Omega. Now, there are loads of different perspectives and different angles to appreciate from these specific recordings. However, the most significant of them all has to be this one angle at the starting line. Now, sadly, the footage doesn't exist until the female runners just pass the camera, so we can't see exactly what happens at the start here. But what is apparent is that you can see this person right here holding a white flag. And the one thing that is for certain from this perspective is that the flag is blowing dramatically with the wind. Now, it's a little bit of a challenge to decipher the precise direction that this flag is blowing, as again, the gusts were super strong on this day, probably hitting multiple directions during this 100. But it does appear as though the wind, at least from this flag's movements, were moving from behind and slightly perpendicular to the athletes. This means that the wind was likely hitting the athletes, at least during the race at some points, at a diagonal angle, meaning that it was likely benefiting them to some degree. 
This again is another piece of evidence suggesting that the wind was indeed blowing well in excess of 0.0, .0 meters per second, and it also showcases a high likelihood that at least during some points of this race, it was blowing in a favorable direction to the athletes. If we take a listen to the actual call from the announcers during this race, you can hear him call that there was no wind, and yet there is an obvious sound influence from the wind itself. Another clip showcasing some very interesting evidence comes from this clip here using a fisheye lens, and it captures Florence's world record from around the 50 to 60 meter mark in the stands. This racing footage is quite fascinating, and it really does showcase the nearly perfectly executed 100 meter dash of Florence Griffith Joyner. And while nothing too notable can be surmised from the racing footage itself, just moments after the race, some 15 seconds to the exact, the camera operator focuses in on the wind reading and the wind reading gauge. Now, thankfully, this is the exact piece of evidence that would be needed from this very race, so we're lucky that this person knew exactly what to do on this day. And as you can see, the wind reading was again 0.0, .0 nothing new there. But if we focus in on the anemometer, we can see clearly that the wind direction is blowing not perpendicular, but slightly angled, probably around 45 degrees on average from behind the runners here. Again, this isn't concrete evidence, nor is it something that showcases what happened during the actual race. But at least for now, it's the closest thing that we have at this point in time, showcasing a reliable wind direction reading within minutes that the racing actually took place. While one of the gold standards to any mysterious event is the actual footage of that said topic, this is one of those special cases where even video evidence can only go so far. The truth is, no matter what we see before or after the race, the only variables that really matter is what happened during this 10.49 second race, and despite the strong criticisms surrounding the ratification of this world record, 10.49 seconds still stands as the world record. For this quarterfinals race, it is quite obvious that Florence Griffith Joyner had the performance of a lifetime, and even though she was far ahead of everyone else here, the other times actually showcase something quite unique. For Florence's quarterfinals record-breaking run in the early afternoon, the second and third place finishers were Diane Williams and Gail Devers, who finished in 10.88 seconds and 10.98 seconds respectively. Now, focusing specifically on Williams, this 10.88 time was a season's best by a whopping 0.21 seconds, given that she ran a time of 11.07 seconds in the first heat just a few hours earlier. After these performances on July 16th, she ran two more times in 1988, clocking an 11.33 on August 17th and an 11.40 on August 31st. This is one of the more clear and obvious athletes benefiting from a potential tailwind on July 16th, and if we look at the third place finisher, Gail Devers, we see a fairly similar story, as her 1988 Olympic trials race here was her season's best performance. Now this race is obviously the single most important feature of this video, but if we look at the second quarterfinals race, which was also measured at 0.0, .0 we again see something quite fascinating. Now the athlete that won this race went by the name of Sheila Eccles, and she ran a time of 10.83 for this race, and finishing in second was Alice Brown in 10.92. Now for Eccles, this 10.83 proved to be a lifetime best by a big margin. In fact, this 10.83 was the only season where Eccles ran under 11 seconds, a massive deviation from her expected results over more than her decade-long career. Now, the Eccles performance is certainly significant, but what about Alice Brown, who finished in second in 10.92? Well, just like Eccles, this 10.92 would prove to be a lifetime best, and also like Eccles, this represented a massive deviation from her previous performances. In fact, this was her only 100 meter performance ever that yielded a sub 11 second clocking under legal conditions. 
It seems quite strange that out of all of these performances on July 16th, these two races that were supposedly wind illegal also resulted in not just a world record, but multiple lifetime bests by significant margins. Again, we are currently in no position to say with 100% certainty that these wind readings on July 16th were actually incorrect. However, the fact that so many different issues continue to rise up, the more that is unveiled, is certainly troubling. It's very compelling to see just how big of personal records were actually achieved on July 16th. However, there are still many other factors to look into regarding this world record, with one of them possibly holding even more suspicion than the wind readings. Now, the topic of steroids and performance-enhancing substances in track and field have been a constant piece of discussion for decades and decades. As far back as athletes have been performing, cheating, at least in some shape or form, has been present. For Florence Griffith Joyner, the topic of steroids has taken hold of many conversations not just because of her massive improvements, but because of her physical appearance changes that took a drastic shift from just a few years earlier. Now, building up to 1988, Joyner's 100 and 200 meter times were certainly impressive, holding personal records at the time of 10.96 in the 100 and a personal record of 21.96 over the 200 meter distance. These two times were very much competitive on almost any international stage in the 1980s. However, if we jump to her world records, these times absolutely blew away her previous bests. For the 100 meters, this improvement represented a leap of 4.3% improvement, which is nearly unheard of in this level of sprinting. And for the 200 meters, her improvement showcased an overall time improvement of 2.86. This kind of colossal leap forward in such a competitive event like this is almost unheard of. And at this point during her career, the doubters were laser focused on proving her steroid use. One particular accusation came from an athlete by the name of Daryl Robinson, who actually competed with Flojo in college just a few years earlier. The Joyner actually purchased human growth hormone from Robinson for $2,000. He even went as far as to say that Joyner used and distributed these banned substances right in front of him. He also claimed to have sold her 10 cc's of HGH, saying that if you want to make one million, you've got to invest in a few thousands. After these claims, Robinson was widely blacklisted from track and field, as he was widely labeled as a non-reliable source, and even for Robinson's track career after 1988, he actually never raced again. Now, another complication was with testing, as during the 1988 season, isolating human growth hormone was among many isolates that were very difficult to distill, and was also apparent that random drug testing at the time was still in the very beginning stages of global implementation. Now, it wasn't until 1989 where the World Anti-Doping Agency began utilizing on a much broader scale the traditional random drug testing that we know today. This was utilized as it would allow for much larger scaled testing and given its random nature, a better possibility of catching abusers out in the field. It's very interesting to look back at the career of Joyner and the implementation of this random drug testing because as so many of you probably already are aware of, Joyner retired after her 1988 season exactly during the time when random drug testing was implemented, and she curiously never raced a single sprinting event again. In countless interviews, those close to Joyner continue to deny any possibility that she ever used drugs. Instead, her coach and many around her point to a better diet, more water intake, and a total of 5,000 sit-ups each and every day is the source that resulted in not just her performances dropping, but her physical makeup changing as well. Now, throughout her career, Joyner was never tested positive for any banned substance, but regardless of her clean testing history, many point to her times dropping in a significant manner and the world record improvements that were so drastic as two things that were signifying that something fishy was going on. In addition to never actually finding a positive result, many have stated that Joyner did in fact test positive. However, given the high profile of her running, the intense cultural shift that she brought with her times, and the ultimate success that it brought to the United States track circuit, these results were intentionally hidden from the public. 
In reviewing a lot of these bold claims, this is easily the heaviest topic surrounding Joiner, and it's an area where the most rumors and the most misinformation have clearly surfaced over the years. However, once again, it is noteworthy to mention that to this day, no single institution has isolated a positive drug test, meaning that 10.49 seconds is still the time to beat. After a decade of holding the world title as the world's fastest ever, Florence Griffith Joyner tragically passed away in her sleep on September 21st of 1998. She was 38 years old. Now, after passing, the Orange County Sheriff's Office announced the very next day that the cause of death was suffocation during a severe epileptic seizure. Now, this tragic death was found to have been connected to a congenital vascular brain abnormality that Joyner unknowingly had at the time, making her much more susceptible to random seizures. After passing away, Flojo's autopsy included a very thorough investigation for anything related to drugs during her career. However, to the surprise of many, nothing was found. And despite many people expressing that this was the ultimate drug test, there are still many who have doubts, saying that over the 10 year span since she was competing, anything illegal would have dissipated in her system. The mystery of this world record will always be shrouded in endless doubt, and it surfaces with unmatched momentum during every world championship and Olympic cycle. So what exactly can be surmised from the research provided in this video? Well, for one, despite the wind readings holding a finishing result of 0.0, .0 meters per second, the truth is almost certainly different. From the video evidence to the countless interviews, to the sound of the camera at the starting line, to the actual Omega operator on the day, the wind was clearly very strong and it played a significant role in the overall finishes of these two quarterfinals. Second, and perhaps most significantly, many reputable sources themselves have expressed strong doubt from many different variables. However, probably the most constant source of confusion is the wind reading instrument itself. It seems so incredibly unlikely to see two races consecutively after very strong wind readings that read exactly 0.0. .0. For many, logic can show us that these two races were significant outliers, but it is also very rare for a wind reading to be exactly 0.0. .0. Since the introduction of electronic timing in 1968, this is the only women's world record that was achieved with a wind of exactly 0.0, .0 meters per second. And only adding to the argument is the fact that on this day with such significant winds and gusting, a wind reading of precisely nothing did seem very unlikely. Lastly, and this is actually something that we haven't touched on until this moment, in addition to the 100 meter times on that day, we also had the men's triple jump going on before, during, and after the women's 100, and throughout this multiple hour event, we have only positive wind readings throughout this six round competition, with only two wind readings representing a legal wind reading. It's also noteworthy to mention that in the final round, Willie Banks achieved what would have been a new world record with a triple jump of 18.20 meters. However, given the tailwind of positive 5.2, more than double the allowable limit, this was not allowed for world record consideration. No matter how many ways you analyze and interpret this performance, there will never be a concrete answer. So at the end of the day, you're free to make your own decision on whether or not you think this world record was legitimate. Thanks for watching everyone, and as always, until next time.